now. Okay. So this is master class number five, and uh, we're very happy to have Aiden Ritchie with us. Um, YouTube, Reddit, and now Discord celebrity. <laughs> so we'll we'll let you introduce yourself in a minute, but uh, first, let's. Uh, I know you're going to play a solo. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. I'm going to have to take these off to play. What is it you're going to play? Oh, he can't hear me now. Cool. So hopefully no one else is talking since I, I can't hear. I'm going to uh, start today off with number three, R and B from uh, Bob Chesney's Harmonic Dexterity book. Just a little etude to start off the day. Yeah, go ahead and that was that was beautiful by the way. Um, tell us about yourself and uh, you're going to be doubling today I know is the topic for the master class. Yes, so um, as it says in that corner, um, I'm Aiden Ritchie. Um, I'm obviously trombonist, low brass player. I would say primarily a bass trombonist, but we're going to talk today about why you shouldn't say that. Um, I went to school at University of Wyoming, um, University of California, Los Angeles and got both got two degrees in bass trombone performance um and i freelance in los angeles i do a few things i play in the disneyland band as a substitute i don't have a full-time job there just a substitute on bass trombone and third trombone um, i did have an orchestra job on bass trombone for a year and a half um, and i got fired because i didn't go to enough concerts because they paid really badly we'll talk about that too um and I, I just freelance, I do a bunch of stuff. I mean, like, you know, as a freelancer, there's no, like, set list of things you do. It's just kind of random, so I can't talk about all those things. Um, and I'm going to talk today in my masterclass portion about um, doubling and my journey and how maybe you guys can approach your journey through doubling. Cool. Well, um, are we hearing people play first, or am I talking? Yeah, um, we're going to have one 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 person to coach and then uh because you're gonna do a lot of doubling stuff we'll just uh leave it at one so right. um first up and we have joey aka professor skywalker 
cool. who's going to play uh, some uh, some Percy Granger for us. Let me just grab the music here. Um, do you want my video off or on? Uh, it'd be good to have it on if if you're okay with being recorded. I think. I mean, that's fine. I threw privacy out the window when I joined Facebook. So. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Yes. Yeah, so whenever you're ready, uh, hit me up. You gonna play the whole thing or just part of it? Um. It's not super long. I could play the whole thing if you would prefer. I just play some part. Actually, if you only want me to play part of it, it's essentially two runs of the main verse and then a kind of big variation of it at the end. I could just skip the second run of the main verse. Or you could start on the second one, maybe, and just play straight yeah. from there. Yeah, that's fine, too. All right. In that case... Um, yeah, you can see it says more feelingly. Yeah, God, God yeah. love Percy Granger. sounds pretty darn good not saying like I expected less but great um, so I think we have a few things we can work on you're playing all the right notes in pretty much the right time I think now we can just kind of pile on some details right um, so if we can go back to the more feelingly part the just kind of the, the main verse um, one main thing that I notice is that the kind of the ends of phrases and notes before you take a breath are pretty short um, and in the land of music land especially of trombone music we have the side of marcato over here and we have the side of legato over here um, which which side do you think this piece falls on legato legato or marcato definitely more legato except in one or two specific spots yeah, and even like when there are marcato uh, markings in a piece like this, these Venn diagrams of marcato and legato don't actually touch. There's always a little space. I think this piece is entirely, and I can't remember which one I said was which, this piece is entirely within the legato realm. So even when there are staccatos or accents and things, it's still within that Venn diagram of legato. So that should affect basically all of our note lengths, all of our note ends, how they taper, all those, all those little kind of things like that. 
Um, and I'm especially noticing it when you take a breath um, after a note and just kind of the ends of phrases. So just for instance, um, I'm going to play like the first line here more feelingly and I'm going to over exaggerate and kind of do what I'm hearing. There's like a hard edge, swing, and since this is in the legato realm over here, we want all of those just to have a little bit of taper, even when it's just a quarter or just an eighth. So I'm going to play that again and try and get entirely within this, this realm. <laughs> taper that note just enough to make that a soft edge, right? Because we're in legato land. There's no hard edges to anything in this in this um, Venn diagram. So just play the first up until maybe like linger slightly. Uh, maybe just play that and see if you can soften the edges of just the ends of notes for now. That's the only thing we're looking for. Okay. <sighs> there I think right now you're treating the breath like it's a separate thing from the music so there's music there's playing and then there's kind of like a space and then there's a breath and then there's music again um, and one thing I got from a lesson with uh, David Cantero the principal trombone of Ellie Phil he's, he's like the easiest way to get better at like breathing in music is to think of the breath as part of the line it's not a separate thing and not a physical thing you have to do to survive it's part of the music, and it serves serves the music rather than just serving you to not pass out. So try and fit those breaths in as if they are notes, even though there's no actual space. Uh, there's like, I mean, there's little like breath marks. No, there's not even breath marks. There's nothing. The notes all touch each other, right? So that breath mm -hmm. has to fit in there like it's a note that you're kind of inserting mm -hmm. into the music. So here, I'm going to play the first like few measures again, um, and I'll exaggerate. Um, what I'm hearing, and then I'll try and get across <clears throat> what I'd like to hear. So not only is it a little bit separate, but it also scoots the time back every time, right? It kind of uh, um, inserts like maybe an eighth note or sixteenth and just kind of, if someone's playing piano with you, they'd have to go whoop, uh, and then they have to come back in after that happens. As opposed to hopefully this. We'll see how this sounds. <laughs> super great. But you get the idea. They're in time and they're just squeezed in between those notes just in the right spot so that you're not interrupting the line and the breath almost feels like it's it should be there rather than it's an extra thing that we have to add because we play a wind instrument. kind of want to make it sound like it's a bow change on a, a string instrument rather than you know taking a breath like we have to do. So can you play those first lines again see if you can fit those breaths in like they're part of the music like they're notes. Okay. <laughs> 
cool. I think that's a step in the right direction. We're not going to like uh, dwell on this right now, but keep keep working on that. Play this with a metronome, even though in real life this is not with a metronome. Um, play this with a metronome, but make sure the breaths are not scooting the time back, right? Um, right. And in performance, you're not going to play this metronomically, but um, for the sake of phrasing and making sure that the breaths are not changing the time, use the metronome. Now let's go over the details of articulations because we have a whole bunch of different stuff here. We have um, tenudos, we have a whole bunch of slurs, of course. I'm trying to scroll. This is not my music. Don't scroll it. That's fine. <laughs> Derp. We have uh, tenudos under slurs. We have tenudo staccatos. I mean, we have just like all these different things. Um, right now, the articulation is kind of all... It sounds good. It sounds like it's in the legato sphere. I'm glad. Um, but it all kind of sounds the same. And we want to make sure that the stuff written on the page is just really blindingly obvious to someone who's not looking at the music. Um, if I, for instance, if I were not looking at this music and I were listening to it, I'd just kind of assume it was all slurred. And I want to hear just those little differences like at linger slightly and then slightly lingeringly. <laughs> So the first one, linger slightly, measure 44. Um, this one's tenuto under this, um, this thing. And then the next one is tenuto staccatos, right? There should be a big difference between those two. So it has to be completely different than measure, what is it, 5, 6, 7, 40, uh, measure 47, slightly lingeringly. It has to be completely different than measure 49, uh, for instance. So just try playing pickups to measure 45, um, to measure 40, measure 50, I guess, and see if you can make me, convince me that those are completely different um, markings. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I think 47 was way different than 49. I like that a lot. Um, but measure 45, I don't know. I feel like maybe there's a little too much front. Um, I wasn't convinced that that had a slur over it. So a lot closer to what's on the page, um, but I think you can really get into this. Now check out, we have these awesome markings. Linger slightly, slightly lingeringly. Really delve into these. Um, I'm interpreting that as just a slight retard going into like measure 46 and then again going into 48. Um, so see if you can get into that. And just for kicks so we don't have to do this again, look at the dynamics. We have mezzo forte coming down. You're not going to do a lot of that because you're already going down in pitch so you don't really have to like decrescendo a lot. And then a nice leap at piano, and then you're going to get louder the second time. So not only is the articulation different, um, but the dynamics are basically flipped. So you go loud to soft, soft to loud. Um, I'm not even going to play it. Let's see if you can convince me that those are the dynamics and the tempo markings. Okay. <laughs> So dynamics, I think we're there, but the articulations all kind of washed out, all kind of sounded the same, and I wasn't really getting those um, tempo markings. So linger slightly, it's kind of awkward. I would probably play that um, beat three pickup in the 45, kind of long. That's kind of the linger. says don't soften do not do not take crescendo at all until the next measure um, I probably wouldn't take a breath before measure 49 right now you're taking one after that last quarter note in 48 and it kind of breaks up that don't soften like kind of uh, driving line through that so maybe find a different place to breathe 
um, so that that line continues and doesn't have a swing in the middle of it. Let's play the same thing again, see if you can put in more of those details. Dynamics were good. There. Yeah, that's a difficult line. Um, maybe take a breath before 48. I don't know. I mean, I was feeling the same thing when I was playing it. Um, it's hard to not get all the way, or it's hard to get all the way through that D in measure 50. So, something you're going to have to experiment with. I think the point I'm trying to get across is in just these five, six measures, of this relatively simple piece. There's no crazy range things. There's no crazy rhythm things. There's so many little details that you can focus on to make it way more musical. Because if you just play, if you ignore all the markings and just play the notes, then we get kind of like middle school band music, right? Um, but if you do all these things that Granger has on the page, all of a sudden it's a little more interesting. It's more music, right? And then there's more that you can add on yourself on top of that. But you want to make sure you're doing all those things above and below the notes first. Um, can we scroll down to the kind of the end-ish? Yeah, right here should be good. So now we have a little more rangy stuff. Um, we have a thing up to high A a couple times. High A is our top note. Let's uh, hit down there, it's measure 79, first speed accompaningly. So I guess someone else is playing with you at this point and you are not the focus. Um, we're not going to care about that right now because you're by yourself. Let's see if you can really nail this stuff. I think the if you wanted to put a peak, like the, the tippy top of the piece, where would you put it on this page? Probably, I would say around 70, 70, 71. I think that's a good spot. I think it's a little more, it's a little longer than the spot I'm thinking. So you're probably right. Um, but I'm all about measure 81. Um, well, we have A, A, G, F, E, D. That spot, like just that octave leap, boom, boom, and forte. I think that's like a really important um, little line. And it, it's not the peak. I think you're right that that earlier spot is the the more major peak of the entire piece, but out of this, kind of this last page, I think that's a really important spot. So, um, let's start at linger slightly above that, measure 73, measure, or pick up to 73, and play until the end, and see if you can really bring out that spot, that octave leap. I just want to be really convinced by that. And you can take okay. a second to like look at all these markings that you're going to play now. Um, don't be in a rush. I have to look at him too. Okay, hold on. I need to empty my water because it's yeah, go nuts. I I will be right back. I'm sorry. I have to go to a different room to do it. Cool. I I don't have anything in here. I just do it on the floor, everybody, because I'm a, I'm a heathen like that. Um, so while he's gone, though, check out, everyone check out the dynamics, or not the dynamics, the articulations here. We have a bunch of different stuff, right? articulations we have just in these last whatever that is 16 something measures um, there's lots of stuff that has no articulation on it and since we are in this legato sphere over here those need to not be like pecky or a little short they don't need to have too much front they need to still be in the legato sphere but 
not have any extra stuff over them, right? Um, so yeah, check out Linger Slightly, measure pickups to 73 to the end and see if you can just convince me. That's close. It's real close. I think um, I think the main thing that will convince me is time. Right now, there's all these linger slightly, slow off slightly, lingers ever such a little. That's not even a phrase, Granger. Um, first speed, lingeringly, slow off slightly. All these little things, you kind of just, uh, just train right through them, right? You're just kind of going metronomically. Um, it's good that you have good time except for the breaths, every once in a while those, those kind of um, slow the train up a little bit. But I think this train can be going up and down some hills, and I think that'll help sell this a lot more. Um, where's a specific spot? Um, like that octave leap. I'm going to keep talking about this octave leap. One thing that'll help you play it, and one thing that'll sell it a lot, is if that eighth note before the high A is nice and long, nice and fat. So starting at first speed at 79. <laughs> So, look at this section again, um, kind of, you're kind of playing most of the articulations and stuff pretty well, and the dynamics and stuff, just kind of forget about that stuff and look only at the tempo markings, and see if you can do just those for me. Okay, at linger slightly or first speed accompaningly? Uh, yeah, start at pickups to 73 again, the same spot you did earlier. Okay. <laughs> just insert a little bit of space, a little bit of time every time. And so I'm like, yes, the train's rolling, it's going up the hill, it's going down the hill, and then it keeps going, and I'm like, yes. And so there's just like little spots where the train like loses a frame and then keeps going. So um, just record yourself. I mean, even listen to this master class after we're done recording it. You can just listen to yourself play. And, you know, you don't have to put on a metronome to check, but you'll hear those little spots where it hitches and then it keeps going, right? And as a listener, that just uh, takes you out of the music, right? And especially on trombone, since we have such a weird instrument, we really got to like keep the listeners away from the trombone and more in the music. And that's just, ah, it's just taking me out of it just a little bit. Cool. Well, um, great job, Joey. Thanks for playing for us. Um, I think you got things to work on and already sounds pretty good. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks for that, Aiden. And uh, so I can leave my camera on if you want a face to talk to, but uh, um, I might do that for the Q and A. Now I know you're going to talk about doubling, and uh, just for for those who are curious, um, I'm just curious what you what kind of doubling you mean, and and what's with all the instruments on the table. 
Uh, well, I guess I'll talk about some of that. I have notes. I have like a whole thing that I wrote for this. Um, yeah, these are most of my horns. I'm actually missing a couple out of this. I'm actually not sure. I have a lot. Um, but I have like, what is it? Three, four tenor trombones, contrabass trombone. No, four and a half tenor trombones, contrabass. I have two basses, only one right here, and euphonium. So just kind of general low brass. I, I do play two of it. I don't own one, and I haven't played one in a long time. So I'm not technically going to say that I do that, but... That is another option. So just kind of general low brass doubling. I'd say in Los Angeles, this is not atypical. There are a lot of people that I know who will have this entire collection, and they'll be equally or better than me good at all these instruments. So not an uncommon thing, um, and this happens in New York City and like a few other places as well where you just have to kind of play it all in order to freelance successfully. So I have... A whole talk about this. I'm gonna to have to stop and drink water a bunch of times. I have to take these off. Um, I'm not gonna probably play a lot, so sorry if you wanted to hear me play. It's about it. So starting off, I'm talking about doubling. Uh, doubling basically just meaning like you play more than one instrument, right? And I want to preface this with um, the fact that I am by no means like done with my doubling journey. I'm not just like equally good at all these things and I'm now just like maintaining. I'm constantly trying to get better at even my primary instrument, bass trombone. I'm not finished with that journey. Um, I've got two degrees, I'm 30, like you might think, oh he's professional, he's done. Nope. Um, I got a long ways to go and I'm not satisfied with how I play any of these things and I probably never will be. So just to get that across, um, I'm not saying I'm the final arbiter on these things, just this is my journey. Um, and I have a few points here. They're kind of in order of importance, I guess. And the first point is you need to have a good chop setup. So it's, it's sometimes hard to talk about the mechanics of the face and how they all work and like how we should play and use air and use our buzz and stuff. But this is really important, especially if you're going to be playing multiple instruments. Because if your setup is kind of inefficient or it's really tailored for one instrument, it's not going to successfully and efficiently be able to play all of these. Um, especially, I'm going to say healthily play all of these. It's real easy to kind of mess up your face. Um, and I've definitely done so on a couple occasions, um, trying to play two instruments, but not really having a good setup for one of them. And it just kind of messes me up in the long run. Um, one thing that Doug Elliott likes to talk about, and I've taken... A lesson with Doug Elliott, he's probably the person you should get a lesson from if you want to get better at the whole chop thing. One thing he talks about is having concentric circles. So I'll we'll talk about rim sizes and stuff in a bit. Um, but if you play multiple rim sizes like I do, um, basically the concentric circle thing means you're going to put the mouthpiece where the, uh, the throat is um, in the same place every time. These are different rim sizes, and I'm going to put them in the same place so that if you, you know, like graph them out on my face, the circles would have the same center. So you're not like putting this one over here and this one over here. It seems like kind of an obvious thing, but it's it can uh, trip you up when you want to put them lower or higher because they're larger or smaller. Um, basically, just kind of keep them in the same place, and you might be able to play different rim sizes that way. And again, um, I'm going to... Shout out Doug Elliott a lot here. He's kind of a, a chop guru. He kind of just knows what's going on. Um, and he makes mouthpieces, obviously. I have a couple back there. Um, and if you want to get a lot better at playing in general, but also doubling, he's kind of the guy to get a lesson with. Um, what am I next on that? Um, so once you have that set up, and this is still part of the first point, um, you basically kind of play all the instruments the same way. Obviously, there are differences between every instrument, just how they, they feel on the face and styles and things. But the all that kind of stuff basically is the same. Um, even like contrabass to small tenor, I'll play them both on the same day. And I'm definitely changing things, but they are not just like wildly different instruments. So once you do have that good setup, you kind of set in, in a way. Um, the second big point I have is sound concept. 
you will get basically nowhere on any instrument until you know what you need to sound like. Um, and I'm going to say that that concept needs to come from hearing people in person live. Obviously, right now, that's kind of rough unless you can like, you know, sneak into someone's house while they're practicing because there's no live music happening. Hopefully someday when the world is, you know, not being 2020, um, you can go to concerts, you can play with other people, um, you can play duets with people, you can go to master classes in person, all this kind of stuff, and you'll be able to hear people live. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that recordings are really good. I listen to recordings too, but they are maybe 20% of the effectiveness that listening to someone live is. Um, I listen to a lot of recordings, but every time I go to a concert or I play with others, um, I just get so much more out of it than I do listening to a recording. Um, who's someone? Well, at Disneyland, for instance, I play with a lot of really good tenor trombone players. Um, and at the time when I started on tenor trombone there, I played tenor trombone. I'm not going to say I was good at it. And I learned so much from just being in a section with like two other really good tr tenor trombone players and got like 200% better in the space of like six months just from having those people around. So it just immensely helps having good players next to you. Of course, if there's bad players next to you, then probably not gonna get a lot better. Um, you need to listen to a lot of players, a lot of different ones. It helps to have like a single sound concept, but you know, listen to more people and listen to a lot of styles. Um, not every instrument here right now plays the same style, right? Euphonium and small tenor trombone kind of almost never do the same thing. So you need to listen to the styles that all these um, double instruments encompass. Um, like, I don't just play all these because I want to play classical music. I play them all because they do different things. And you need to listen to those styles that they make, not just the ones that you're on like a narrow track with. Um, and the third point on that little small point is you need to record yourself to tell if you're even getting close to that sound concept that you think you might have. Um, I've been there so many times where I'm like, man, I feel great. And then I record myself playing an etude and I'm like, that was awful. <laughs> Back to square one. And that happens all the time and that's okay. That's just part of the, the journey, trying to get better. Um, yeah, once so once you have a sound concept, in your head. You know you're supposed to sound like on big tenor or small tenor or contrabass. It is way, way, way easier to just pick that instrument up and play, um, especially once you have the chops done. That was obviously the base of the pyramid we're talking, um, we're going up in uh, um, importance here. The base is like chops. The second one is sound concept. Kind of once you have those first two layers, it's way easier to just pick up an instrument and play rather than taking two hours to like warm up and be like, how does this work again? It's a lot easier once you have those two things done. So my personal journey, real quick, I'm just going to skip right through it. I started on euphonium way back, um, but I really kind of got more into bass trombone faster um, and got a lot more better at that than I did any of the other instruments. And I kind of doubled this whole time, but bass trombone was my main instrument and I had a lot more sound concept for that. So when I picked up tenor more seriously, I had a hard time with it for a while because the feedback you get from the instrument, the sound you get, just didn't match my sound concept for bass trombone. So I struggled for a long time until I realized that I needed to sound like tenor trombone. And so I listened to more tenor trombone players, um, kind of dialed things in. I was like, oh, okay, that's the problem. And I've added on more instruments. I've gotten much better euphonium. I used to like just not play it very well and now I have much better sound concepts so I just play it better um, and my most recent acquisition was my Bach 36 which is a medium bore trombone that was actually one of the hardest ones so far because I have like contrabass, bass, large tenor, small tenor and in between there is medium bore trombone which has its own sound it doesn't sound like those other instruments so I was kind of trying to make it sound like big tenor or small tenor. And I was just like going bing pong, bing pong. And it actually took me like a couple weeks to be like, oh, this is the sound it makes. It's in between these two things. Even after kind of, I'm not going to say mastering all these instruments, but just playing them a lot, 
getting the medium or trombone to fit in between there, get that sound concept correct, took some time, especially now since I can't listen to other people play medium or trombones, really. So even at this more advanced stage, and it's not really advanced, um, it took me a while to pick up a new instrument, a new instrument. It's even an easy one. It's just a tenor trombone and B flat. It took me a while to pick that up and sound characteristic on it. Um, the next big point that I have is you need to play characteristic equipment, right? Um, it's cool to say you double, but you need to play the instrument that makes that sound. Um, and the big one, of course, I think we all see a lot is you need to play just for instance, a bass trombone with a bass trombone mouthpiece to make a bass trombone sound. Um, there's some people that will say, oh yeah, I've played bass trombone on my 88H or my whatever, large bore tenor with a 5G and it sounded great. And you know what? You can play large tenor trombone low and it'll sound pretty good, but it doesn't sound like bass trombone. It's a whole new sound concept. It's not radically different, but it's different enough that the two don't match, right? If we have more Venn diagrams, they don't actually touch each other. Bass trombone is its own thing. And the same can be said for any of the other instruments as well. Um, and you need to play good enough equipment for it to be worth it, right? Um, I think there's a lot of people that have, say, a large tenor trombone, and then they have like a student model small trombone that they've had for a long time or whatever, they got it for cheap. And that counts as a small tenor trombone, but in most cases, unless you got like a nice Yamaha or like an old ambassador or something. They just don't sound great, they're not super fun to play, and it's not really enough to be worth it to say that you double on small tenor until you get something just at least a couple steps above that. Um, that's a good instrument. Um, and of course, I'm not saying you guys all need to play, some, uh, play the same things as me. Um, it's totally on your taste and the places that you play and stuff. Just have good enough equipment to make it worth saying that you double. Um, there's a lot of like really cheap, crappy euphoniums out there. I wouldn't buy one because they're not fun to play and people are going to notice and it's just not going to be a great time, right? So have a good enough thing to make it worth it. Um, and the last point on the equipment thing is the mouthpiece has to be correct too, right? And that's a tough one because there are people like Jim Nova, who's giving a master class next actually, um, he doubles on all this stuff too and he plays soprano and like he's just an amazing player. And he plays everything on the same rim size. He plays a Greg Black three rim size. And he has that all the way from his soprano mouthpiece to his contrabass mouthpiece, way, way over here. Um, and the rim size is the same on every one, and just the cup changes and all the rest of it changes per instrument. Personally, I can't do that. I can't make a good bass drum uh, sound on a small mouthpiece like that, and much less contrabass. That seems really silly to me. So I play different rim sizes. but. I do play a larger rim size on small tenor and like a medium tenor than some would um, if they were only playing those instruments. Um, right now I have a six and a half AL on my small tenor for instance, but it's too small. Um, I can play it, but I can't get the same kind of like endurance or sound for a long time that I can on something slightly larger. So I have to go down the more difficult route of trying to find a mouthpiece that's the right size cup and throat and all that kind of stuff, but has the right size rim for me, which is like 3G-ish rim size. Not the rest, just the rim size. So again, that's just one of those journeys you have to take. Um, if you guys have ever seen, I have like 70 mouthpieces or something, so I'm constantly getting new things and trying them out, um, and it does cost money. We'll talk about that later. Um, the fourth big point that I have is you need to play them all as often as possible in practice and performance. So right now, the performance aspect, I mean, some of us are making like multi-tracks, um, we're playing duets with other people online, maybe you're playing with real people, um, maybe you live with them or something. Not a lot of performance going on, but in practice, play them as often as possible. Um, and as often as possible may not mean that you play them very often, you know, um, but I try, if I can, to play every instrument every day um, because that just makes your life so much easier down the road when you're like, oh, I haven't played small tenor in two months because I've just been playing other stuff and I haven't had the time to get it out, and then you have to play lead on salsa or something. You, it just makes your life a lot easier to try and get things out as often as possible. 
Um, a big thing about that is even once you have the chop set up and the sound concept and stuff, um, it's easier to get an instrument out and just play it. But these instruments are physically different than each other. Um, holding up the small tenor trombone and the bass, they have different slide widths, they have different places where you put your hands, they weigh differently, they have different balance, um, and most importantly, the slide positions are literally different than each other. They're both B-flat instruments, but the slide positions are not the same. The intonation is not the same. The fifth partial D above the staff, not in the same place. And you need to have that muscle memory per instrument still in your head all the time. Um, it's not good enough to just whip out the horn, sound pretty good, and just be ultra out of tune because you don't remember where things are on the slide and you're trying to play it like a different instrument. So literally just for physical sake, you need to play them all as often as you can. Um, I, I just, I don't like want to call people out, but I feel like there are people who say that they double and then they play basically just one instrument all the time and they have the rest sitting in cases. And maybe they do double, but they, I feel like they should probably play those instruments more often to get the most out of them and the most out of the doubling aspect so they don't show up and go, oh yeah, I can't remember how to play this. Um, and next you need to get to know the repertoire of that instrument. Um, if you add up all the repertoire for all these instruments, it's way too much stuff, but I can delve just a little bit into each one of them, play tenor etudes and solos, play um, tuba etudes and stuff on the contrabass. Um, I have a semi-good grasp on bass drum on rep because I've played it for the longest. Um, start playing the more noty stuff on euphonium so I can kind of get that aspect of it. Constantly just spreading my, my knowledge of each instrument. Don't just play the same Bordonis on all instruments. I mean, that's a good thing as well, but try and do the more characteristic stuff per instrument. Like on the small tenor, uh, I've started playing the JJ solo transcriptions. I can't play them at tempo or anything, but I'm trying to get into that side of the instrument rather than just playing carbons on it all the time. I'm trying to get in more characteristic feel. Um, and of course, a really important one, if you play bass drum or something and you're learning tenor, you need to learn clefs. You gotta learn tenor clef, um, transposing treble, if you play euphonium, or even tenor trombone, and alto clef. You need to learn those things because it's not good enough to just be able to play them really well. You have to be able to read music, right? Um, and learning tenor slash um, transposing treble has been huge for me because uh, I actually, right before all this happened, I had just gotten a spot in a brass band, a British style brass band, as the principal euphonium. And that's all transposing treble clef, which is tenor clef, but all the accidentals are wrong. And if I had not practiced that, I just would have been sunk. I would have no idea where any of the notes are. And guess what? They helped me a lot. Um, so my routine of trying to play these all every day is right now, um, this is not my house. I'm sorry, guys. I don't have a kitchen this nice. Um, I have a practice space downstairs, and I'll have all the horns just lined up. It takes up, like, all the floor space because I don't have these stands right now. Um, and I'll literally just play each instrument in a random order all day. And I'll play the Bordonis with a drone on just to make sure I'm playing them all in tune right, especially contrabass because it's got different positions. Um, and I'll just try and play them all every day. But ironically, working for this master class about doubling, I basically just played bass trombone and a little bit of time trombone because I was like, oh man, I need to prepare for that. And I was like, I'm, I'm even breaking my own rules because I have a bass trombone performance coming up. Um, and that's something that happens in real life. Um, when I'm busy as a freelancer, I'm usually practicing the instrument I need the most, the most, and I'm trying to play whatever instrument I haven't played recently, I'm trying to play that one as well. So I'm trying to play at least two a day, not just one. One instrument a day, not great. I think that's probably the wrong idea. So my last point um, to doubling is, what's the point of doubling? And basically it comes down to, you want to be able to say yes to anything that gets thrown your way with no hesitation. And now is that possible? Not necessarily. Um, there's still things that I can't do at all. If someone was like, hey, can you play principal on Mozart Requiem, which is an alto trombone part, I'd say no, because I have an alto right now, but I'm really bad at it. I can't read alto clef. 
Um, so I'd have to say no. If someone was like, hey, I want you to play in this um, jazz combo on tenor trombone, we're doing 45 charts, and they're all handwritten, I'd have to say no, I can't do that. I can't improvise. That's a huge chunk of trombone playing that I can't do. Um, it's a big old part of the pie graph that I'm just leaving out right now because I haven't worked on it yet. Um, so there are things I have to say no to, but generally, if I get a call, they're like, hey, can you play euphonium on this thing? It's in Transposing Trouble. I'll be like, yeah, sure, gotcha. Um, hey, can you play principal trombone on this concert? Sure, I got that. Can you play contrabass on this recording session? Great, yep. Can you play tenor, bass, and euphonium on this musical? Yep, cool. No hesitation. I could just say yes to those. Instead of going, well, uh, I, I'm not really good at tenor clef, and they go, okay, bye, we'll call the next person. You just want to be able to say yes um, in order to make money. And of course, none of that's happening right now, so the point is kind of mute, uh, moot, but uh, at some point, hopefully this will all start up again and we can play music and make money again. Um, you don't you don't really want to be known as someone who doubles. Like the really, really good players, the studio guys in LA, for example, um, I should say studio people, um, there are women in the studios as well, um, they're not really known as doubling. Yes, they are doubling, but they're so good on each instrument, they sound so characteristic on each instrument that people aren't like, oh, he's a, he only plays small bore, tenor trombone, and yeah, he can play the other ones whatever, you know, it, it sounds okay. No, they, they sound so good that they just hire them because they play all those instruments. Um, and you want to be known as that person. You don't want to be known as, I'm a bass trombonist who eh, kind of dabbles in that stuff. No, you want, to, you want to be known as, every time you show up to a gig with a different instrument, they assume that's your primary instrument. I play euphonium. And, you know, you go to a, uh, I go to a brass band gig and people are like, Oh, where'd you study euphonium? And I'm like, <laughs> nowhere. I didn't do that anywhere because that sounds awful. Um, but you want that to be the case. You want people to assume that when you show up to something, they're like, yeah, that guy's a great, great tenor trombone player or great bass trombone player, whatever it is. Um, you don't want to be known as a dabbler. You want to be known as more of a, a doubler, I guess. I don't know. It's hard to word that correctly. And don't use doubling to say, to excuse yourself for not sounding your best, right? Um, if you go to a gig on something and you're not quite great and the person next to you is like, hey man, is that a, is that a double? Is that not your main horn? You don't want to get that question. You want to, you just want to convince people, right? Um, and the last thing in this little part is sacrifices will be made. This is not just like a, everybody should double because it's perfect for everybody. Um, if, if you're compared to someone if I'm compared to someone, for instance, who has gone to conservatory for orchestral bass trombone and they've, they've got like two degrees in it, and they compare them to me playing the same rep, they're probably going to beat me out because they have devoted their lives to the one thing and they're super good at that one thing. And that's something you do miss out on a bit when you do all of this is you cannot literally get the time to devote yourself that hard to that one thing. And that's something you're gonna to have to accept or not accept if you don't want to double. Um, and you just want to be straight ahead jazz player, um, orchestral tenor trombonist, whatever it happens to be. It might be a better idea not to do this doubling thing. Personally, I love like orchestral rep and all that stuff, but I can't just do that 100% of the time. And I have a lot of fun playing all these instruments. So I'm totally accepting of the fact that I will never be you know, like just the world's best player at every one of these things. I'm going to be pretty gosh darn good at all of those things instead. And that's just something you're going to have to accept. Another downside is obviously cost. If you're buying just bass trombone, you can get a really nice bass trombone for seven grand and it'll last you the rest of your life. And you're done. That's it. You can get a mouthpiece that fits you and you're done. This is more than seven grand. It's more than one instrument, and I can't buy the best possible instrument every time. I have like a really nice euphonium, and that's kind of it. All the rest of these are used horns that I've kind of cobbled together, like this one. Um, I've gotten lucky with a kind of cheaper Contra that's actually pretty good, but not as good as a new German horn. 
Um, there's no way, unless you're just like a millionaire and you can do this for fun, that you can buy an entire Shire setup for every instrument or a Rath or whatever. And that's just something you're gonna have to accept. You're gonna spend more money and you're gonna get less for it if you want to have all these instruments. I'm cool with that. I'm, I like buying and selling things, so that's not a big deal for me. I don't need the shiniest possible thing. Um, but for some people, that's definitely going to be a downside, and that's, that's totally fine. Um, but to counteract those points, I have gotten so much better at bass trombone from playing all these things. Um, would I have gotten this much better just practicing that instrument? I don't know, maybe, but all my playing on all my instruments has gotten so much better from playing all those instruments. So for me, um, expanding that circle, doing all those instruments at the same time has been way more fun than just working on that one sliver of the pie graph. Um, it, more fun and more, more fulfilling, uh, both of those things at the same time. And it's just a great way to work on your weaknesses because we all have weaknesses as players. So it kind of wraps up my talk about doubling. Um, we can open it to questions now. Um, and I hope that was informative because that was a lot of information. Thanks, that was, and that's, it's going to be useful to go back to the recording to, to rewatch this a few times too for all you once we post it. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. Yeah, let me open those. Um, one person asked, if you have a practice session, rehearsal, or gig on tenor or any small or large bore and bass trombone, what tips do you have for a solid warm-up routine? Um, so some people have like, and I didn't talk about this in the master class, um, some people have like a set thing, or like they start on the smallest instrument, they go to the largest instrument, they just do that really consistently. Um, I see it this way. In real life, you don't get to choose. You know, you might have the contrabass first, and then right after that, you have to drive somewhere and play lead in a jazz band or whatever. So... I play every instrument totally randomly every day. Sometimes I'll play the whole warm-up on one random instrument. Sometimes I'll play the whole warm-up like bit by bit on every instrument in a random order. So I, I keep it completely random. If I do have a gig, I will warm up on that instrument. Um, but that's basically it. I try to keep it as random as possible because you know, once the world starts back up again, it is as random as possible. And I'll, I'll be playing like five instruments in a week. And if I were only warming up on one thing, it doesn't really help all those things. It only helps that one thing. So I try to keep it super random. And that really helps me just pick up an instrument and play it. Um, if you have like a set routine, it takes an hour when you go with smallest to largest. You don't always have an hour to warm up. So I don't know. I just try and keep it really random because I... I always find myself in these times where I only have like 10 minutes to get a warm up. I have to like drive for two hours, get out of my car, and people are already on stage. And I'm just like, oh. and I think it's a good thing to be able to just play that instrument right away rather than always having like a set routine. But for some people, that routine works. And I think there are definitely like studio players in LA who will do the same thing every day. And they, they probably have time to do that when they're lucky. Next. That was Nathan. Yeah. Hi, Nathan. Um, this is from the prettiest lady. Have you considered doubling a woodwind tenor sax, for example? Have you basically uh, anything outside of brass? <laughs> so that, that actually is a good question because there are people who do the kind of crazier doubles, like maybe they do trumpet, maybe they play percussion really well or piano or something. I put so much time into brass that starting a new thing like that, like I've played piano in college and stuff, Percussion doesn't seem that hard. Woodwind is just so different. Like, I have some skills that apply to that, but all the, like, basics of the instrument, I don't know anything. So, uh, I just, I like, I know so many good saxophone players that it just seems like a total waste of time to pick that up. It's actually kind of why I don't play tuba, because I know so many good tuba players that um, it's a lot of money for a new instrument that I have to spend a lot of time on, and I'm not sure how well it would pay off. So I think it'd be cool to play woodwind instruments, but yeah. I hear you on that. Um, where do you get a uh, contrabass trombone sound concept and who do you listen to? That one's actually kind of rough because, um, and somebody was talking about this recently. Um, right now there's no unified contra kind of even instrument, much less sound concept. 
Europe is much more solidified in that regard. They just more, basically if you play bass trombone, you have to play contra as well. So there's a lot of players, a lot of sounds coming out of Europe. In the US, it's just, it's random basically. There's some, there's LA studio players that play it. And there's scattered orchestral and opera musicians that play it. Um, I kind of really got most of my sound concept from those European players. Do I sound like them? Eh, probably not. But I basically just had to like play the instrument and listen to myself and just be like, like kind of guide myself on that journey. Really good question though, because honestly, that's that's a tough, a tough thing to do. There's definitely contra sounds out there that I really don't like, um, and it's kind of hard to steer away from that. So. Nice question. Um, any advice for getting yourself known and out there in the LA area specifically? So I think the best way to do it is to go to school there. I mean, I think that's the case for any place is to go to school there. You're there for a couple of years, four if you're an undergrad, of course. And your teacher will know you, who's probably somebody in the area. And then your students will know you and you'll slowly get like little gigs here and there. And that the people at those gigs will kind of get to know you and it kind of spreads out. If you're just moving to LA, I think it's harder. Um, but I know people who have done that and they're totally successful. So you basically have to get lessons um, with um, top and medium level players. You just kind of get lessons with everybody. So they all kind of start to know you. And if you're good enough, you get put on sub lists and uh, contract lists and things. It's a, it's a process that takes time. If, if you're just moving to LA, you're gonna have to work another job for probably a couple years before you can just like make money, enough money to pay rent, playing trombone or tuba or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, another question from Nathan. Any advice for getting ready for an audition or solo competition? Yeah, so this is a, a tricky one if you're a doubler, you kind of have to give up on the doubles for a little bit. I've done this a couple times in the last couple of years. Um, I went to a festival in Europe. I went to a couple things in Europe in 2018. And I basically kind of put all the doubles aside and just played bass trombone for that. Um, and it was kind of a letdown. It kind of sucks working on just one instrument in the same rep for like months. I forgot kind of how boring that is. I mean, it was fulfilling in one way to get like really good at one thing, but also it kind of sucks. And I also did recently for the International Women's Brass Conference, um, learned and really worked up a couple solos for that. And it is fulfilling in one way, but you kind of have to, if you are doubling at the time, you're still doing it, but it's a much less than it usually would be, for sure. I guess this is the personality thing too, because some people really like to just focus on one and some people really like to. Yeah. Keep and I, I'm definitely not like uh, being down on those people who just like doing that one thing. That's totally personal choice, and I, you know, respect that. Have you ever regretted selling an instrument? So this this question is uh, from Kevin. Um, he currently has a Bach 36 BO that he saved up for in high school and bought brand new, and then he got a large bore for college and feels like he has to sell the 36, but he has mixed feelings. Uh, yeah, I mean. I hear you. <laughs> I've gone through a lot of instruments and I did have like personal connections to a couple of them. I actually had a 36BO at some point. Um, it was actually my wife's instrument and it was really good and I loved playing it and I never used it. So I ended up selling it and it actually paid for a better bass trombone. So for me, it was totally worth it. Um, the problem with the 36 is it's so similar to the Lars Bohr that it's like not good enough of being a small board to be totally worth it. I actually have a 36 now that I love. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to use it though. That's the problem. Um, also, um, 36s are not worth a whole lot of money. So if you only want to make, you know, $900,000, uh, you could sell it. But if that's not worth enough, like if it's worth more as an instrument than it is $900, just keep it. And this from Sam. Um, Sam's a euphonium player primarily who has been playing bass trombone for a little under a year now in a couple university ensembles and is finding that um, his individual ranges are okay, but connecting them is very difficult. For example, middle F down to trigger E. What's your advice? So Sam, this is one of those things where the, the chops have to just be like 100%, right? Um, 
I also played euphonium and bass trombone a lot in undergrad. So I was a euphonium major for like a, two years or something like that, but I mainly played bass trombone. So I was doing a lot of both. I was taking lessons and playing bass trombone. Um, and you really, I'll give you like a simple exercise that I think will help, but I think a lesson with Doug Elliott, look him up. Um, lessons are not too expensive. Um, a lesson will really help. But here's a nice simple exercise. I'm going to take off one of these. And all it is is just glissing down from a comfortable note in a scale. So B flat scale, for instance. So you kind of get comfortable with glissing that down, connecting all those notes, the air constantly moving, and then just add notes onto the bottom. changing towards the end or if in the middle it has like a weird spot where it fuzzes out and then comes back just try and um, even that out you can buzz on the mouthpiece doing the same thing uh, even though I can't buzz very low so that's of limited use for me just try and connect that um, on the mouthpiece and on the horn and get a lesson with Doug Elliott I'm just gonna keep shouting him out because he helped me so much recently And it uh, looks like we have one more question. Uh, is concha really expected of bass trombone players? What about tuba? I've seen some jazz band arrangements where the bottom trombone part is supposed to be played on tuba. So I'm going to go out and say that I really only play contra because in Los Angeles, it's kind of an expected double for the studio musician. And I'll also be honest and say that I've never been paid to play contra because it's still pretty rare even in a place like los angeles that has lots of that kind of stuff happening i've even played a couple studio gigs i've only ever played i've played euphonium tenor trombone and bass trombone but i've never played contra um, other than that you use it in the opera orchestra it's like you know there's like studio stuff opera and then every once in a while orchestra music it's not a common double i have it because i got mine for semi-cheap not cheap in the grand scheme of things but grand uh, cheap for a contra and it's really fun to play i like contra tuba i think is a way better double to have and to play and if you can just get like a cheap b flat tuba you're gonna get a ton of work playing tuba and i kind of i wish i had one but they're expensive and big and i just cannot bring myself to buy one so if you're going to choose between contra and tuba i would choose tuba i should have one too so actually, for anyone looking for a way to have access to a bunch of instruments that you can't afford, um, you can always teach uh, middle or high school if you want, and then you'll basically have a mu music studio to yourself. Or uh, I started working at a performing arts center recently, same thing, just access to all the instruments that I don't own, um, just as a, a fun side note. Um, Aiden, it's been, it's. I think we're... Yeah, we're, we're well past the hour mark, and I, I want to respect your time, but um, we really appreciate you having, we really appreciate having you here and, uh, and being willing to, to haul up several, many pounds of instruments <laughs> of metal. Yeah, that took to like half kitchen. an hour. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate it and, and can relate to the setup, so um, it's been really nice. Um, if you want to say anything else, uh, I know you're you're around on Discord, you're around on Reddit, uh, modding the trombone subreddit. Uh, you've got a YouTube channel. Yep. And uh, if there's anything else any, we should know about or any other place to find you, anything coming up, any fun projects aside from being isolated? <laughs> yeah, still isolated. Um, at some point, Zachary, Liddy, and I will do a duet. I don't know. We're being really slow about it. I don't know, not much else. I do offer lessons, but I think there's other people you could get lessons from first that'll probably be more worth it. So, you know, if you choose me, that's great. 
Um, otherwise, thanks, uh, Joey, Sam, Nathan, Richard, Cameron, Raymar, John, William, Digicats, Gatti, Ryan, Josh, Bryce, Kevin, kind of sound on the previously, Dan, Claudia, Anthony, Barrent, Christina, Darkinium for coming, and thank you, Brian, for uh, uh, moderating. You're welcome. I thought you had those memorized for a second. It was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm horrible with names. <laughs> Uh, getting a lot of thank yous from the chats. As always, we appreciate you, um, and we appreciate you all for for making the time to be here with us. Because there's no point in having a master class without an audience. Yeah, thanks uh, everyone for coming. That's great. Well, our next one's uh, John Gruber in two weeks on July 26th, and then uh, Jim Noble will join us August 9th. Um, cool. There's yeah. also uh, it looks like we might have a joint master class collaboration with uh, Kyle Gordon. From the uh, Persian um, zone, yeah. From the uh, um, U.S., it's the Army Band server. Yep. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you back on the server. Bye bye.